as uh, pr previously stated, uh, bevacizumab has four positive phase three trials um, showing that it improves outcomes, whether you look at response, progression-free survival, or in, in two of the trials overall survival. So I definitely think it's an option for patients who are eligible to receive it. Um, you have to be selective in patients that you recommend this drug in. There are lots of reasons not to use it, but in patients that don't have the reasons not to use it, I think it's an important part of their uh, treatment regimen. Um, uh, the typical toxicities, uh, risk of bleeding, particularly hemoptysis, uh, the boxed warning includes GI perforation. That's an uncommon event. I've certainly seen that in my practice, but it's quite uncommon. There are no ways to predict that. Um, hypertension is an uh, issue that you have to be aware of and follow, although it's usually not unmanageable. Um, uh, you have to be um, careful in following a renal function on patients and, and looking for proteinuria. Um, there are a number of very uncommon things like uh, reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy uh, and other things that, that happen with this uh, drug, but they're exceedingly uncommon. And for the most part, um, bevacizumab is a relatively well-tolerated agent as a single agent. You know, our strategy with bevacizumab when we use it with carboplatinum and paclitaxel is I typically administer typically four cycles and then I would continue bevacizumab as maintenance therapy until disease progression. I find that once patients get to that maintenance part of treatment and they're only receiving the bevacizumab and not the carboplatinum and paclitaxel, that they tolerate it exceedingly well. Um, so I, I think it, in general it's, it's a well-tolerated agent. The initial trial, ECOG 4599, which tested uh, the addition of bevacizumab to carboplatinum and paclitaxel, um, excluded patients with brain metastases because there were some early issues regarding the safety in that population. So when bevacizumab was approved in uh, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer around 2005, it was initially approved in patients who did not have presence of brain metastases. If you look at the non-squamous population, about 20% of them have brain metastases at the time of diagnosis. So we actually early on um, launched a trial called the PASSPORT trial, and the primary objective of the PASSPORT trial was to see if you could safely give bevacizumab in patients in the first or second line um, uh, in the setting of treated brain metastases. Um, we treated, I think it was 116 patients, where the primary endpoint of the trial was rate of CNS hemorrhage and we saw no significant CNS hemorrhage. And so actually the label was changed based on the PASSPORT trial. And as I stated earlier, that we have established safety. If the brain mets are treated and controlled, and we know that this gentleman had a follow-up MRI that showed no new brain lesions following his stereotactic radiosurgery. So under those conditions, I would say that uh, bevacizumab is safe in this setting, although initially this was an agent that we very cautiously used in patients with uh, brain metastases. We don't have any studies about the safety of bevacizumab in patients who have untreated brain metastases. And that's why um, earlier in the case discussion I said that uh, uh, treating the brain metastases if you're considering using bevacizumab is a critical part of, of management.